Welcome back to Hello County. We are reeling from all the information from our guest, Leslie Reitmeyer, who, uh, well, she's, I mean, she's so much more than a loan officer. She, I mean, she's a, she's a mortgage broker, mortgage banker, and she works with a fairly new entity here in Wisconsin, and specifically, she's uh, in Milwaukee County, because at Hello County, what we do is we celebrate people, places, events, all Milwaukee County. And you can, you can consume all this amazing, con amazing content that we generate, uh, ideally on the website, because that's where you catch the live stream. By the way, we are live streaming from Vendetta Coffee, specifically their Tosa location. So we are staying nice and caffeinated at 7613 West State Street here in Tosa. And uh, Vendetta does have two locations. And I do believe that's where uh, Barista Austin is normally functioning out of. But um, I, I actually see Leslie in the background. Leslie, don't forget to hand Austin the flyer. Do, do, do you need this one for him? You've, she's got flyers. Anyway, uh, bro brochure. It, technically, it's a brochure. But uh, because Austin needs your contact information. By the way, Leslie has been regaling us with the, the how-tos, the pitfalls, the benefits of, and she clarified this for me, I thought for sure that nonprofit mortgage, which is, by the way, a coveted 501c3 non, not-for-profit organization, I thought for certain that if, if you were Mr. or Mrs. Moneybanks, that you, you would not be able to be serviced, you know, through, through someone like Leslie. But she corrected my, my, um, my assumption, because you know what happens when we assume. I'll leave it at that. Um, and that, no, you can be Mr. and Mrs. Money, money Bags. You won't qualify for the down payment assistance program, but you can still take advantage of the fact that there won't be any closing costs and some other great deals. She works with 27 different lenders. She's going to match you up. And she does both residential and commercial work. Why, so, uh, why are there no restrictions on the closing, helping people with closing costs? I'm sorry, Just, what? Why are there no restrictions on who can apply for help with closing costs? Um, oh, because, good question, because... The organization that's part of their, I think it's, it, I think technically it's part of their not-for-profit mission. Okay. You know, so what they do is um, profits that they do make, they funnel into a fund. Yeah. And so while you have to qualify through like HUD type checklist regulations to qualify for the down payment assistance program, you do still get the savings aspect of the of no closing costs oh. by being a client a customer of oh. the not you know the nonprofit mortgage group huh and so that's why you can be Mr. and Mrs. Moneybags okay and it behooves you to still use Leslie what was the most even though you can comfortably afford the closing costs what was the most surprising thing you learned about Leslie well, that was the most surprising thing. That was well, okay, that was the most surprising thing about the organization, mm -hmm. which is, is new. I, 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 I'm tickled that Leslie began her affiliation with this amazing organization about the same time we launched. Okay. That was fun. So very recently. That was fun. Yeah. Because uh, we're just 10 weeks into it. Now, just because she's new to that organization, she has a solid 30 years of mortgage broker, mortgage banker, broker. She's all that. Started when she was nine. Yeah. That's what she said. That's good. But it changed to 12 and she does not look like a grandma. Okay, that surprised me. 
got smacked by that. The other thing um, that really resonated, well, let me actually go into our community sure. chat because Don, hey Don, said excellent guest today. I am passing her name on to my daughter as you should. Again, you know, the thing that surprised me the most regarding the organization is that while you may not qualify for the down payment assistance, you, there are no restrictions, as we just said, and you can still save, uh, save a bundle of money. And a lot of times, if you're a money bags, you might be a money bags because you, you pinch those pennies until they scream. Not always. So that said, um, Dan, I know that you were chatting with her once we were off camera. Some, some, some Bayview love, it sounded like. Uh, did you have any, what were some of your observations or takeaways from our amazing guest, Leslie Reitmeyer? Uh, yeah, we were just talking shop about Bayview a little bit, but um, yeah, just uh, nice to have someone be approachable about a fairly in, inapproachable or unapproachable sort of topic. It's a very confusing thing, so it's it's good that uh, you know we have channels and people like um, Leslie to, to help us navigate these uh, confusing. You are so right, structures. and don't look behind you, Dan. <laughs> By the way, we can hand you the God mic anytime, Leslie. If the, we can hand you the God mic. The God mic anytime if you want to if you want to continue and join in in our next segment. <laughs> right now, this is kind of our kind of our what what do you call it? Like if it's sports, the post, the whatever game. This is where we sing your praises and talk about how fortunate we are to have had you join us and how much we learned. Especially Dan, he really learned a lot. Actually, I'm pretty sure Ben heard some really good news in there, too. Some, some, some good advice. I'm sorry? What do, it's Ben's turn to say, what did you learn from Leslie? Mm. No pressure. She's right next to you. You know, I'm still trying to, to figure out. It was a out, lot of information, wasn't it? Figure out how to move without uh, dealing with a higher interest rate mortgage. So it's a work in progress. I'll, I'll thread that needle one of these days. Okay. Um, okay. So. And while um, we did pick her brain, and hopefully it didn't hurt too much, but we did pick her brain, and, and um, there, there, there's some... There, that's what I say when it's mine. There, there was, she, she indicated that, you know, uh, per, per experts, industry experts, that there might be some good news in the horizon, but we also did give the disclaimer, she does not have a crystal ball. She's not, she's not a future fortune teller, but what I can assure people is you will be in such good hands, such knowledgeable care. Go to Leslie. And, and you know, if you're, if you're thinking about buying or selling, I'm assuming you handle both, right? Buying or selling. More the buying, more the buying, because you're you're working on that side of the equation. That's exciting. Or if you just want to find out about street angels, or what was La Casa, give her a call. You know, she can talk to you about all kinds of things, but especially if you have. Exactly. But don't call her if you want to discuss Ayn Rand. We gave her the opportunity to stick around. Uh, by the way, our big topic today mm. is, is um, objectiviz ob objectivism. Still a thing? Should it be a thing? What the heck is it? I, Ayn Rand was passionate about it, and we're going we're gonna to deep dive into that. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. So um, actually, did you have more, more post-guest 
before we deep dive into the big topic? No. I feel like it. <laughs> Like it got darker in here all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, and the sky is darkened. Yeah. Just at the mere mention of objectivism. <laughs> how was the uh, how was the drive in today? Oh, the drive in because of the weather was a smidge challenging. Uh pretty pretty all the way until around Pewaukee ish area. And then it was yeah. Raining, misty rain, heavy rain, misty again. People seem to forget how to drive in 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 both you know um, wet road conditions, whether it's frozen or still liquid. Uh, I don't know what that's about, but uh, so it just makes it a little more tense. But uh, you know, still you know made made it when I normally roll in and park and. Did you do any uh, hydroplaning? I did not. I did not. I Hydroplaning ex- when doing your commute is bad. I do exclusively hydroplaning. Pardon? I, I like to do exclusively hydroplaning. 90, 100 miles an hour, just glide right over the water. Because he's just a, really a daredevil. It's better for gas mileage. It's a Conserving fuel on gas yeah. by, you know, just get really up to speed and then just. Um, well, that's just crazy. Dan's going, sure. Or just the fact that Dan was ignoring your hydroplaning comments. Could have been he was just tuning you out. I can, I find that reasonable. It's like, you know, when you decide to talk about something. Yeah, interesting. Realistic here, mister. Um, so in a. We don't recommend hydroplaning, by the way. It's scary. In a I mean, minute, I guess if you're in an empty parking lot, it could be fun. In a minute, we will just take a short pause kind of cut this so we can divide the segment and then we'll talk about whatever the heck you want to talk about uh, with respect to you, I don't you agreed. know you agreed to the big topic I, agreed I to ran it. it past you and I don't remember how it came up but um, or why, <laughs> why it became a topic how did we get on this to begin with but Deb is, is digging in so we're going to see what <laughs> happens uh, so what we're taking a yeah I'll let you just no, like a 30-second, one-minute break. 30-second um, break. Awesome. Stay tuned, everyone. And as promised, we're back. Thank you so much for staying tuned. And if you are listening to us, and it happens to be Wednesday, September uh, 27, all day, That means, congratulations, you're joining us on our website. You're catching the live stream, and congratulations to you. And on the live stream, one of the reasons why we get so excited about that, as opposed to Hello County YouTube channel, which... If you're, if this is how you're, you're uh, consuming this content, you missed it, you missed it during the day. You're, you're checking it out later at home, relaxing. Someone sent you a link. If you are watching, seeing us on YouTube, Hello County, don't forget to like and subscribe. But uh, the best part about uh, joining the live stream via the website is that you can register. It is quick, painless, it's free. And when you do that, you can jump into the community chat pool and interact with us real time, just like Mark and Dawn did with our guest, Leslie, when she was seated next to me only moments ago. So again, our guest, Leslie uh, Reitmeyer, who is mortgage banker, broker extraordinaire, working with Wisconsin's nonprofit mortgage organization, and they are a bona fide 501c3. If you didn't catch that, 
definitely either through the website, the YouTube channel, whatever, go and catch that interview with her. It is so jam-packed with really usable information. And we thank her for joining us. Now, that said, we are now going to shift into today's big topic. And the big topic, I vaguely remember, now I know I did suggest it, it might have even been last week. I think Something it might have been last week. Maybe on a Thursday. No, I think you're right. Lord knows what we were talking about at that point. I don't remember anymore. But <clears throat> somewhere in there, Atlas Shrugged maybe came up, or Fountainhead came up, or Ayn Rand came up, and, and maybe we were talking economics, or who, again, who knows, really. Yeah. We, we talk about so many things. That's part of the the joy of being us. Um, but in there, we, we kind of thought, hey, it might be fun for a big topic to do a deep dive into Ms. Rand's uh, love of objectivism. She was all about objectivism. And, um, and at that point, you seemed a little bit more excited about it. <laughs> Ben is I right think, now. If if I if, I, if I could if I could paint a petulant child's face, get with you can't see him, but that's what I'm looking at right now. Fair enough. Because Mister, we are doing this. No, I'm uh, I'm interested to see where it goes. <laughs> I feel like it's, you know, maybe you are. I'm not a uh, particularly well versed on. Uh, her or her philosophy. I, I've kind of touched it uh, or come back Just to it periodically and tried to understand what she was getting at. Uh, maybe I'm just kind of, you know, a numbskull or something and it's not c getting we will through. Well, not to me. have self deprecating humor but, uh, like that here. Well, that's the only kind of. Guy. Okay. Um, that's the only kind he does. But <laughs> so in preparation, okay. you know. I guess just for the record, you've read you've there, read there is still an Ayn before. Rand Institute. I'm just sure that's a hop in place. It's a big um, thing. What, which books of hers have you read? You read? I have, in fact, um, actually this is kind of fun because I asked Dan, and uh, did you did you say you tried one of them or just you you didn't even pick one up and? I've tried, yeah. You okay? So Dan has tried. Uh, Either one or both of them even, depending on, because the two big ones, she's written more than just these, but her two big ones that most people will recognize, even if they don't remember Ayn Rand, uh, would be Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. And pr prior to Atlas Shrugged, uh, I believe um, Fountainhead came before Atlas. I don't Atlas. know which ones came first. Actually, it was Fountainhead. Yeah. Fountainhead came first, and in fact, she was critically acclaimed. And by the time... And, and that's where she got on a lot of interviews and things like that, possibly the Mike, Mike Wallace interview that I shared with you. But um, after that, she did write Atlas Shrugged, and that had mixed reviews. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I, to me, I only read uh, one of them. <coughs> I think The Fountainhead. Uh, that was definitely her, her my big sense critically was that acclaimed... They were both of her two big books were kind of the same, but maybe they... They're they, similar. Yeah. They're uh, similar. Similar themes or something. I'm not sure why she wrote the, the second one, like what she missed I mean, in I, the first I one. I want to say Atlas Shrugged, um, and I'd have to double check, you know, like kind of, kind of little footnotes, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. It, it was homage, I want to say homage to um, Wall Street. Okay. But that could have been why she wrote Fountainhead, the homage to Wall Street. But I want to say it was Atlas Shrugged that she was really more... But I think we should try to... More about uh, that. ...define for anyone that's watching what... What the what heck Ayn objectivism... Rand, I don't even know if I, I'm articulate is. enough to <coughs> speak uh, competently on that. But well, I, because I our guess guest, I can give like sort guest, of a broad... You know, uh, no was definitely tapping into it. She said, oh, she's, you know, capitalism, you know, da, da 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 And it's like, well, sort of. Yeah, I think, like, there's this sense in which uh, Rand was very skeptical of altruistic behavior. 
and she was not a fan and sort of At obligations uh, to all. your fellow men and she found this kind of coercive and uh, potentially like destructive to the human spirit or something and she was she was yes big in individuality and my free, first ex- free market as yeah. in a pure free market which she admitted we don't have even even then we don't have yeah and her definition individuality and things like that like i remember reading in 11th grade one of the required one of our required books english lit kind of thing english things? literature class is that when fountainhead came across here no this was ayn rand's it was a shorter book probably like 150 pages oh called anthem and yes. It was kind of, yes. I remember being very intrigued by this book and thinking it was uh, profound, you know, to a 15-year-old. And, it, and maybe I'd read it again. I probably wouldn't think the same thing. But, you know, you shouldn't dismiss the things you found important even when you were a kid, even mm-hmm. if you think they're stupid later. But, um, you know, <clears throat> the whole premise of this book was a society where the, the word or the concept for I... Uh, didn't exist um, so this is clearly and it was oh. sort of a dystopian uh, oh. world uh, as I recall all those years ago reading it so clearly and Anthem was pro or against that that you just described I'm uh, curious about that well so if the, you recall the world without I was a dystopian sort of hellscape and I remember that the protagonist journey was discovering you know the sense of discovering individuality, I? and that was kind of the big climax reveal of that, that that's the book. big reveal um <laughs> and so she was obviously like pro pro i pro the concept mm-hmm. of i mm-hmm. and individual individuality and which actually you described that beautifully she would have been prior to the discovery of it she would have been describing a hellscape <laughs> yeah so in preparation for this uh maybe this is where we can start okay uh In preparation for this, you sent me a link to, I think, a 1966. Was it 66? Yes, sir. Interview. uh, I was six. With Ayn Rand by a guy named Michael Wallace, who I'm not familiar with. A lot of people should know, should recognize his name. Yeah. Mike Wallace. And they did a sort of a 30 minute interview. So it was. Gonna, mm-hmm. We're going to talk for two hours about a 30 minute interview. No, I, I think we can expand. That's yeah, not exactly what we're doing, but maybe. Uh, <coughs> but I don't know. You watched this. What did you What did you think about it, or what were you thinking? Okay, so first of all, I'm scrolling because that's what we do, right? This is what people do now. You've got your phone and you scroll, and I was scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And all of a sudden, falls into that weird, quirky, your phone is listening to you conspiracy. Okay. Because somehow, someway, Ayn Rand's name came up. We actually jotted it down as, hey, this could be fun for a big topic. And it was, I think, that very night at home, scrolling. And I see random interview by Mike Wallace of Ayn Rand. And it's like, huh, I didn't Google her. (laughs) You're listening. Yeah, that's creepy. Oh, by the way, it says 1959 interview. The 66 might have been the other one you sent me that I couldn't. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for checking that. And, um, but when I saw that interview, and clicked on the link. Before I clicked on the link, one of the comments is what really caught my eye, even more than just, you know, I'd have clicked on it anyway because we'd been just talking about her. But the comment was that clearly the interviewer, Mike Wallace, it it was evident that he did not agree topic-wise, ideology-wise, whatever, whatever, with his guest, Ayn Rand. But the interview was polite, respectful, informative. And kudos, Mr. Wallace, 
And again, that was a few decades ago, and we need more of that. That was one of the things that, I, that really, um, and then I clicked on it, and because I thought, ooh, how could she tell? You know, or here I said she, I don't know who, who did the comment, but it's like, ooh, how could they tell? And, and you could tell, but he was so respectful and professional. What were your, what was, okay, so, so using that as our jumping off point, what did you think of the interview? I thought it was interesting. Um, I'll admit that Ayn Rand, I don't know that I would like her as a friend. She doesn't seem particularly pleasant. She wasn't a warm fuzzy. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't very, yeah. I, uh, I wouldn't gravitate to her. Right. Um, and yet, many, many people did. So much so that there is still an Ayn Rand Institute to this day. I mean, that's a fair point. Because I think, um, I know as a teenager, reading uh, The Fountainhead, because I think I read it probably after I read that book, After Anthem. Anthem. I was like, kind of digging it and you know Ayn, Rand, Ayn Rand's uh, sort of thing that I think a lot of people find irritating but I found interesting was just the long 15 page monologues of the individual characters where they sort of pontificate philosophically for pages on end mm -hmm. about you know the spirit of man and s society. And you didn't mind it? No I found <coughs> it I found it uh, inspiring in a way and I, I just remember like I uh, marking it in a book and telling my mother she needed to read it and she did I don't think she thought much of it she probably was being nice uh, to me or something but um, you know it's, it's, it's lovely to hear that your mother was supportive but I think it kind of speaks of young Ben you know, young Benjamin all of these the kind of these long monologues of hers uh, yeah. mm -hmm. speak to like the teenagers uh, yearning for uh, individuality or like trying to Ooh. separate themselves from the herd or something. So there's kind of this adolescent. Absolutely, there's an appeal. This adolescent appeal uh, to it <coughs> that I think I, I don't hold uh, nearly to the same extent uh, I, as I, you know, cared about it then. Um, but I thought I would read, I had the transcript of that interview. Please do. So I was just going to read. Uh, Michael Wallace asked her for her uh, definition or to like encapsulize mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Randism. Uh, and she says she hates that term. She likes objectivism because it's based on objective Correct. reality. Correct. Uh, and she, she kind of goes on for a bit. But then she says, um, my morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. Um, and since man's mind is his basic means of survival, if man wants to live on earth as a human, he has to hold reason as sort of this absolute uh, good, I guess. And his only guide to action is, is through reason. And he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, and his higher, highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness. And he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him. Each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's a good uh, paragraph, mm -hmm. and there's maybe a lot to unpack there. I mean, yes, that's exactly it. There is a lot to unpack there. So thank you, by the way, for actually just reading her answer, that transcript. I mean, she was, uh, if nothing else, yeah, I can't take intellect away from her. She was a well-known intellect sure um and and many gravitated toward her for uh, that reason i found it uh interesting that she was born and raised in the soviet union she was quite young but i want to say she was at least 18 she was still young though but she did travel alone to the united states yeah, let's see <coughs> here. We'll look that up. She definitely was from Russia, it, Russian born, and she was probably Russian even older than eighteen because she 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 again, finished Dan? university in in the Soviet Union. I thought. Oh, okay. Russian educated. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, 
I think that's kind of an actually an important point. Um, I think there. So I think it comes off as like that's that whole statement very strident and absolutist. And I think one of the interesting things that I've kind of learned about uh, maybe like discourse, you know, in like the the public discourse or or civil discourse or something is that all these statements that people make kind of assume some sort of background context that people don't necessarily share. And so when they, mm. they see the statement in isolation, they're like, oh, that sounds insane and strident and not... Out of context. Well, just not true. Like, and, but I think if you, if you understand the context uh, from which people make these kind of assertions you start to understand it a little bit better. So I think it's obviously important that she came out of uh, Soviet Russia. It's kind of key, actually. What's that? It's kind of key. I think so. Actually. Um, Be- because, of course, you know, um, and certainly, you know, this was during Cold War and, and everything else, and, of course, you know, being called a commie back then, the, them there were fighting words. And so this was the environment that young Ayn Rand was born into, um, and so she was able to see firsthand what that looked like, because you know, a lot of things look fabulous on paper. A lot of things sound really awesome in theory. And then when you, you know, reality or practice, a lot of times things tarnish and fall way, way short. But I think you know, so that clearly affected her view i think russian a lot of my favorite authors are russian Mm -hmm. and i just wonder like they always sort of took this internal struggle and like this greater struggle and and brought it within and brought it out i just wonder like how she turned into such a like a bootlicker or like why why is she such like an outlier yeah it's like almost the opposite of what all those other writers are doing yeah. you know i just oh, yeah. never oh. understood wait like, so yeah contrast her with one like a russian writer you're thinking of as kind of pick one all different. of them you know they they like, like had to exile they had to leave you know because they were right the state was down on them and like they had to write in you know hidden basic you know like the, you know they had to keep their stuff underground where I don't know, she just kind of propped up all those ideas of the Soviet Union. And, I mean, she got a pass for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why, but... Well, didn't she leave, like, didn't she immigrate and then kind of spoke very... To me, like, her whole philosophy is kind of uh, in um, a, a criticism of, like, the Soviet Union style oh, very of critical. living. Um, so I didn't, yeah, I didn't get the sense that she Yeah, supported. that's like distinctly, oh, go ahead. you know, Russian, you know, like, you, you know, like if you're lucky and able to get out of it and be able to speak critically of it. But she she was more for the uh, uh, like sort of oppressive roots that the Soviet Union instilled on its people where I feel like most other Russian authors were exploring the uh, individualism of the world and you know the subjectivity of the world where she was objective you know and she's yeah. saying that I, I don't know that's it's just, just it's yeah confusing. i don't know enough about like i would my intuition was that i mean i think she is different from other russian writers like i feel like the one i'm a little bit familiar with is like uh, dostoevsky and you know he ultimately was uh found answers or what he thought were kind of solutions to these problems in like Christianity and things like that. So it was almost a religious kind of spiritual perspective, whereas Ayn, Ayn Rand's definitely like the opposite of that. She's I, like, I feel like a lot of those other Russian authors, you know, spoke of Mother Russia, okay. s- spoke of so- like socialism, talked about their families, their brothers or sisters, you know, like it wasn't about me and she always okay. made it about I me. I see what you're saying. That's what I'm yeah. saying. No, I think, I think there's something... Like one of the criticisms um, I once read, and I want to come back to what we were talking about mm-hmm. a second ago, but I think there's like an interesting digression, is that of Ayn Rand is that children play almost no part in any of her of her books. Um, she she didn't have children. She had them. And um, there's a sense in which people wonder if there's something kind of 
missing from her uh, understanding of like the human condition um, with fair. you know this sort of a a very kind of um, you know basic uh, type of relationship the I mean obviously she must have had parents so I'm now I'm curious what her what her childhood was like but also just being the parent child relationship is is one that is inherently sort of altruistic it might even be one of it seems like it might have been one of the Mike Wallace questions where she did talk just a tiny bit oh, really? about life in the Soviet Union okay. prior to her coming to America where she addressed it a little bit as I recall yeah. she was and one of the reasons why she is so very critical of the altruistic yeah. communistic type of environment is that again sounds great on paper what actually ended up happening is palms are greased it doesn't it doesn't oh, sure, trickle yeah. down to the everyday man, woman, and child. And so what you end up having is a very comfortable yeah. upper echelon. And, yeah, definitely. And, and that it doesn't make it down, and you have the severe, abject poverty of the masses. So write down because I want to come back to this, but like problems of communism, I guess I would kind of summarize sort of her, what, how you were describing um, her perspective or, or something yeah, she was Yeah, and, and this is kind of, yeah. But and again, it, that, that's where I like to, to talk about Ein and to talk about objectivism, you know, it, it, you know, and she was incredibly critical of altruism, you know, and I think it, because of the way it dovetails yeah, with you. communism and because of you know what she experienced firsthand and and yet what what I find really intriguing and Dan might have some thoughts on this is the same the same government structure right that she is clearly very critical of and we got to give her that we we didn't experience it but it afforded her clearly a very fine education sure yeah. that she did not pay for that that part kind of intrigued me it's like okay. no one yeah. kind of asked that that i found so let's let's come i definitely want to talk about that i did want to go back to kind of where we started real quick mm -hmm. because you know i read that statement of hers me as a, a person living in america you know seemed a little heavy-handed um and so the point I wanted to make is, is not just that it's important to understand uh, the context, you know, that motivates people to make s the statements that they do, mm -hmm. but also to think about, like, the, the audience in a way. And I mean by, you know, if you're somebody uh, in, like, a communist society, you have to say things potentially that are very extreme to like jolt people out of that image you know if they're kind of, if they've grown up in communism and they think a certain way you have to make a really extreme counter argument uh to to kind of um and i'll give you an analogy to maybe illustrate better what i'm saying to like mm -hmm. to 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 jar people out of the, their perspective for a bit and begin to consider an alternative and i think kind of a similar and thing that, and that and that is the lens from which you can view yeah, like her I disagree with her. Like I find it to, too, to Wallace's too question. Uh, extreme. But I also live in a country that values independence um, and maybe too much, in my opinion, in some ways. But I kind of give, I think, an, an analogy is like, you know, if you are someone that uh, really hates, you know, there's very strong atheists that are always making fun of religion and talk about how terrible it is and all the the destruction it's wrought on the world. I would temper that with there are some. Well, wait. So, but I think, and, and so I hear that. And I was like, well, wait, religion ha has served useful purposes. It's done good things. Um, and can also be damaging. But I also, I also grew up in, um, you know, a fairly normal uh, kind of religious household. But you could imagine somebody in like a very fundamentalist sort of uh, cult-like 
um, religious milieu that that's exactly the thing they need to hear is like, oh, these these uh, God people are terrible and they're doing terrible things and the answer is atheism and you can there's like this alternative. And if they hear that, maybe that's what causes them to start thinking outside of the very kind of narrow context that they're in. And I guess, I guess my point is that I often get upset that people make extreme statements one way or the other, but I think one way in which it's useful is that for particular audiences, that could be exactly what they need to hear um, to get them to kind of think, shock jock, think a little bit shock differently. Shock jock kind of thing. Kind um, of. Yeah, and other audiences Grab your need, attention. Hey, there's some downsides to this thing. Get you thinking about something thing. else. Um, Use a just outrageous statement. Yeah, to she's a shock jock. She's a troll. <laughs> yeah. You know, like... I think it's just people wanted to hear, you know, people wanted to hear this emboldened selfishness and being like, I could be, you know, like Donald Trump these days, you know, it's like, I could, I can believe whatever, whatever I believe and I am inherently true and it's, I'm living in this world. It's just, it's just very childish and it's no wonder the like libertarians and conservatives have clung on to this for 80 years because it's, it's very childish and she's a hypocrite. I think it she is. is. She's a hypocrite, you know. It's like, it, despite the writing and the philosophies, she does not hold them to virtue, and so she's a shock jock, you know, and like always has been. And mm-hmm. and I I love that you brought that into this conversation, wove it into the conversation. I will say, I believe she drank her own Kool Aid. I do yeah. sincerely believe that she well, was not hypocritical to the to the degree that do as I say not as I do sure I think she sincerely believed in her philosophy of course it couldn't ever be proven but then she got government handouts when she got cancer and was on Medicare <laughs> you know yeah and she <laughs> also benefited from her her communist home free education which clearly was an extremely good education. Her, you know, her personal favorite was, you know, shout out to Aristotle. She, you know, my, so she clearly yeah. has some decent educational chops. With like philosophers mm-hmm. and people, you know, and like, you know, even these days and people that have a platform. Mm-hmm. I'm all for you being able to express those things, but when you put other people's safety and well-being and lifestyles in jeopardy, as she does with women. And people that yeah, she was. That was the other thing. And Thank homosexuality. You for that like, up I'm also. curious what your take is about her <laughs> take on women. Like, it's kind of scary and sad. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll read one thing real quick, and then uh, we can move on to some of these other things. Because um, yeah, I do think, like, I think childish is. I think there's something to that. Um, and, but kind of to my point about there are particular people who need to hear a message in particular ways. Well, the shock jock. Um, I found there's <laughs> what we're now lovingly referring to as the shock mind, jock. Um, <laughs> this essay, and I'll read this one part from it. Oh, please do. Because it actually uh, mentions Atlas Shrugged. Um, mm-hmm. So he says, it's really hard to target advice at exactly the people who need it. You can't go around giving everyone surveys to see how selfish they are and give half of them Atlas Shrugged and half of them the collected works of Peter Singer. So like Peter Singer is a philosopher that's sort of on the opposite end where- Of the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. And if someone was yeah, too selfish- Yeah, because Ayn is definitely on an extreme yeah. end of the spectrum. So you so ideally like you could find the people that are too selfish and give them Peter Singer and the people that could really use to be, could really use uh, a being a little more selfish a little and give them Atlas Shrugged. Um, but you can't. Uh, so he, he says. But whatever you do, don't burn the damn darn books. But he says People. you can't even really write really complicated books on how to tell whether you need more or less selfishness in your life. They're not going to be as viable, as readable, or as memorable as Atlas Shrugged. So to a first approximation, all you can do is saturate society with pro-selfishness or anti-selfishness messages and realize you'll be hurting a select few people while helping the majority. And I think like on some level, you know, Rand was kind of in this environment, obviously a, a, came from a communist society, which was very extreme on, in one direction. And 
uh, I think there was a lot of concern in her time, like in the 50s and 60s, about communism in the United States. And so this message was was definitely a product of its time. and that Which also explains her popularity, I think, too, yeah. right? I um, mean, timing is everything, isn't it? <laughs> I, think, I think her message is... You know, she definitely, you know, here she came from Mother Russia, yeah. but she's inc incredibly critical of, of that and, you know, singing the praises of free market capitalism. And it's like, yeah, keep talking, keep talking. But I think that's why we find it... We'll build an of, institute around it. ...kind of wacky to hear today because it's just not the same... It's not the same environment. Uh, we're, we're in a much more and selfish really, world, And yet, really, didn't you say. just bring up some rhetoric that wasn't so far off? That's pretty current. I feel like uh, objectivism is alive and thriving these days if people yeah. just, you know. I think you do. Well, that's what I'm saying. We've gone no too masking, far. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> the, the, just a whole list of things and reasons people think they know they're right. And they live their life knowing they're right, which isn't even... I guess philosophy is just psychological at that point. Like, so, so the majority needs a little more Peter Singer these days, maybe. Maybe a little more um, Peter Singer. So. But, well, here, and here, let me actually get this out, though. So <clears throat> when she was first answering Mike Wallace, mm -hmm. by the way, for, for the kids following along at home, if you get a chance, just Google. Uh, just jump in. Maybe check out the, the Mike Wallace interview that we are you know, initially basing the big topic on, but the really the big topic is regarding objectivism. You know, feasible, not feasible, should we pay any attention, should we understand it, how does it fit in with the, the current American capitalistic society and everything, especially since in recent years, we, you know, we've been hearing more, you know, you hear the word socialist, you know, bandied about like it's a treason, treasonous uh, thing to to even say, and and um, and I and I would just add to that that um, societies we 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 grow, we expand, we change, we learn. Hopefully, we look at history and learn. And one size never fits all. One size never did fit all. And, you know, the fact that, yes, read, read Ayn Rand, read Peter Singer, somewhere in the middle is perfection. That's my view on, on life in general. Extremes are never good. Somewhere in the middle is perfection. However, having said that, when she first was, you know, making her initial statement, and maybe I can even, I think I have it queued up. Let me come back <clears throat> to this. Um, she described, now this is Ayn talking about, you know, um, defining objectivism. Okay. Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> anyway, it says, uh, objectivism is a philosophical system, and she never varied from that. She let you know this was a philosophy, you know, so, and that's where it's kind of like, well, that's great, you know, a lot of great philosophies out there. They don't work in practice, right? But anyway, so a philosophical system developed by Russian-American writer and philosopher Ayn Rand, she described it as the concept of man as heroic or as a heroic being with his own happiness, and this is echoing what her answer was to Mike Wallace, the concept of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life with productive achievement as his most as his noblest activity and reason as his only absolute there in a nutshell quote and quote out of the mouth of Ayn Rand specifically when I first heard that I thought well I'm big into what uh, is law of attraction, and, and it, it, it dovetailed a little with um, the concept being that, well, I mean, law of attraction is just whatever you focus on becomes your reality. Now, okay. that, can be, that can be good, bad, indifferent, whatever. But one of the keys with regard to that for those of us that are intrigued by it and read about it and whatever, is that in order to um, manifest, you know, the, the, the things that you desire, um, 
is to is to one way to do that you know it's one thing it's like asking and it is given but then you need to be open to receive it and that's where most people trip themselves up they might ask you know to win the lottery but they don't believe that they'll ever win the lottery you're never going to win the lottery again you know law of attraction whatever you focus on the most is your reality that said one of the suggestions to you know, to get over that, you know, to be able to be in the receiving mode is to focus on your happiness. So you can see where, you know, I heard that answer and my little ears went, huh? Oh, that sounds like it's gonna, gonna fall in, in alignment with, you know, this thing that I kind of dig. But then she kept going, <laughs> then she kept talking. And then she you know, was talking about the absolute pure free market, which never existed. She, you know, she talked about all of these things. You know. Then it made me question, well, you came from you know, this commun communist, communistic society and you got this glorious free education. It's like, and, and then turned around and you know, bit the hand that fed her. And, and, and it's kind of like, well, what's that about? But then it was like, I can reconcile all of that, you know, the more that, and there's a lot of information for anyone who's, this might be your first introduction to Ayn Rand and these books and the concepts that we're discussing today. Look her up. She is interesting, you know, and again, there's still an Ayn Rand Institute to this day. And my personal thing is I talk about something similar with regard to self-care is critical when we've done personal growth segments and things like that, the, the, the importance of self-care and things like that. I'm not, pre I'm not preaching, if you will, to the exclusion of not helping others, you know, and, and and if you look at Fountainhead and if you look at Atlas Shrugs, sometimes it does kind of come off that way. You know, to the exclusion, you know, everyone else be damned, if you will, kind of concept. And this is what gets people's hackles up. Um, but I can argue, absolutely, that especially for those who do want to contribute to their community. They do want to help their family, friend, and neighbor. You can't give a drink from, from a well that's gone dry. This is where, for me, securing your own happiness and securing your own, what I phrase as, secure your own oxygen mask first. I personally have subscribed in recent years to what I have called and coined airline wisdom. That, you know, and some people might say, well, that's selfish, that's selfish, that's selfish. And it's like, and, and turning the word, you know, taking care of self um, as a bad demonic thing. No, if you, if you want to help others, you have to secure your own oxygen mask first. You're never going to be able to help someone else if you've got no resources to help them. Does that make any sense? That's kind of where I see objectivism a little. Yeah, there are probably people in the world that uh, are not selfish enough in some sense. Like they're kind of overwhelmed with their obligations to other people and are kind of drowning uh, in these types of things. I think there are a lot of people that could afford to be um, less selfish. And uh, I guess this is kind of going back to the, the original comment, but that I think, you know, there is... I think society as a whole, obviously there's going to be, everyone's different, right? But I, f I feel like on average we're probably a little too, too selfish in the sense that we feel like we should be free of all obligations or that we, that, that like the, the idea that we would feel obligated or, um, you know, uh, subject to somebody else's will is very anathema and something to kind of push against 
but I think and I think it's underrated the extent to which uh, serving others uh, is real can be really fulfilling and I mean it in the sense of it's <coughs> it feels good to be useful um, and to and when you do something for others and they feel helped by it like that is a good feeling uh-huh. um, and I think it's a very human feeling to uh-huh. want to figure out and serve and serve uh, ways that you can serve others and like in a capitalist sense it's providing a product that provides value but in a in a communitarian sense it's you're part of the family or you're part of my community I want to do something that helps you and I don't know I, th- I feel like it's underemphasized. In, in a lot of ways in modern society and I, it's definitely you know I uh, would consider it sort of inhuman in a way and I think she's wrong empirically uh, about that idea and I'll, I'll mention one thing because like in that I mean I never said that you should never I'm not, help someone I'm not disagreeing with you I'm kind of talking about like there, like I said, there's probably people that need to hear that message. Um, and I was kind of saying, like, on average, I feel like people could do with less selfishness and more, more serving others uh, type what, of attitude. What what motivates that? If you don't mind my asking. I think it's, I think there are a lot of things in society, like government wise, that are very intent on. We could even, we even kind of mentioned them earlier today intent on kind of breaking these bonds uh, that between family um, like we talked about the guardianship thing right mm-hmm. there's this sense in which yes it can be predatory right to have someone under your legal power oh, it absolutely is yeah and but there is this other very human sense in which it, it's just so basically human that you would you would know your child and what they need and what kind of, you know, what kind of control or constraints they need uh, mm-hmm. to kind of be a successful person. And the state, you know, does different things that I think kind of meddle with that for good, for good intentions, right? Because there are these predatory things, but it's also bad in that there are, I, th- I think on average people in a family want to help each other and are, feel obligated to each other. And we should encourage that. Um, and it's it's just sort of tragic what that if your family is horrible. That's what I'm saying. I think I think it's I think I differ from kind of the I would call it like a progressive worldview that all of these problems can be solved uh, with the right application of policy. And I think I have more of a tragic worldview in the sense that family is is deeply important and these these bonds of obligation and coercion are are deeply important um and yet people can suffer um immeasurably under them and i don't know that there's a right there's not like a a perfect fix right because one size will never fit all right and but i did want to make a note of you know in this in this one thing i read she said that uh, reason is man's only guide to action, and he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind. And I think that's where she's kind of just wrong as a matter of fact. Um, and there's a recent book I read by... So what is wrong with that statement? First of all, it's twofold. Define what you believe that translates to, and then what is wrong with it? That, that an, a single individual can figure everything out that they need to. Um, This idea that someone's independent judgment um, is enough to kind of survive and flourish in society. Because, so there's a good book recently called uh, The Secret of Our Success, and it's by an anthropologist named Joseph Henrich. And the whole premise of this book is that actually... The reason people flourish, you know, is because of uh, the social uh, lear- learning from within a community. And he talks about this idea of, like, you could take the most brilliant person and plop them in the Arctic 
and he would probably not be able to figure everything out, uh, you know, through his own independent judgment and reason. Uh, but what has happened is you've got these Inuits that actually, f- you know, survive know you're talking very about, yeah. well, right? Uh, but what has happened is that over many generations... And can live and thrive in an inhospitable Right. Over many generations, uh, th- that community has learned the ways uh-huh. to survive. And, and what's happened is, like, someone tried something and died... And they did something else, and and there's this social learning that goes on, and so this idea that like the independent individual is like the one that needs, I don't think it's like empirically how societies flourish. Um, Actually, I, I like that. I would be curious, oh, mm-hmm. Ayn, if you were just here for us to ask you, how does her objectivism fit with, you know, because there are still very what we would consider you know tribal uh communities they're few and far between now but you know how does this fit in with that and and she might actually be be able to point out well it does in fact work because there aren't these other regulations in place they are actually living this and this is why they're thriving Mm -hmm. that is what i think i might be able to point out by the way dawn just wanted to chime in she said i agree with Ben and Deb, been there, done that, and years of therapy. Now, that makes me want to, Don, if you can hear us, please uh, please uh, flush that comment out a little bit. What was it about what Ben and I were yammering about that you agreed with? Because, um, you know, we're, I mean, we're not d- just debating with each other. We're just, we're just talking. Yeah. And, of course, Dan came up with amazing, beautiful points as well. Um, but yeah, keep. I didn't mean to cut you off. I think no, I don't. I don't think you did. I think I made made the point. So like, I don't know. She she's very objective she's based on reality. But I think actually it's not it's not really based on reality. Kind of her philosophy. Um, I agree. I would it, say that her ph- philosophy is. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's really not based in reality, period. It, 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 it is some, that. It is a philosophy. And, and I understand its origin being the opposite of the communist country she was born and reared in, um, where she saw firsthand it not work particularly well. She managed to get out of it with a very fine education, but in part because she was educated well and could see where it broke down. And again, the concept of it is lovely, but it didn't work, you know, for the masses that it was supposed to, in fact, protect. And um, ergo, her critiques and criticisms of it. Um, I'm, I'm also wanting to just chime in with, you know, the thing that was pointed out is, well, she never did opt for children. She did get married. Uh, she, she never opted for children. And, you know, at one point, uh, Mike Wallace was asking, you know, well, does this mean don't help anyone? Oh, she was actually even talking about, I, oh, I so clearly remember this part of the, uh, of the interview, somehow with some way regard to presents and, like, Christmas presents. And she personally abhorred you know, the obligatory giving of gifts yeah. and had nothing to do with religion one way or the other. Just And, and, and Mike, Mike said, so you don't like getting presents? And she said, no, I do. If it's someone in my family, if it's someone I'm close to and, and they, they know the stuff that I like and things like that, and I like giving presents to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in, intrinsically she wasn't against gift giving <laughs> one way or the other. And this is kind of where it goes back to um, she had, you know, objectivism is a philosophy. It's one that I personally say we'll never see anything but philosophy because there's no way, you know, I never say never. It, it never got past philosophy, certainly within her lifetime here. She, she, she escaped communist Russia, she came to America, she became American, and, and she, you know, brilliant mind, no disputing, had a first-rate education, brilliant mind, an intellect, and, but my takeaway from, you know, the more I read and hear about her and the philosophy and everything else is, it's like, you know, she became very critical of 
of America. And uh, Dan, you brought out, and yet she was happy to, to be on the dole. And was you know she you know hit the hit harder times and the cancer and this and that and the other thing. My my kind of in line with that is it's like well there's the door, Ein. If you see something else on the entire globe that is closer in alignment with your objectivism it's, philosophy, have at it. I think it's important to, to revisit as like a hist- in a historical context and where they were in their lives yeah. and where the world was, where I think as time moves away, it just becomes antiquated and we live in an integrated world where the individual does not mean as much as it used to. So I think it just... Again, you know, like people and politicians and movements, left and the right, are using these sort of contemporary philosophies that are they're, just philosophies. They're weaponizing, they're, on they're both weaponizing it. There's no way to actually do these things, and you know, they're like speaking in, uto- in utopic senses, where it's like, I think it's important to learn about these things and these authors. So then, you know, when you hear these dog whistles or when you learn about these sort of viewpoints, then you know, like, oh, they're they're talking in a Randian sort of way. That doesn't work in this world. Okay, I, I applaud your intention, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't think any contemporary philosophy... I don't think philosophy, was ever achievable. No. At any you know, point. And I think, you know, in, in like, 20th century but philosophies... You know, because you look back 19th to 18th century, even into like ancient philosophies and the oh, Greeks yeah. and all that. Like, like her buddy Aristotle? Those, those, to me, those are very applicable to the, the human and the mind and all that, where I feel like contemporary philosophers were just like, well, what if this? And then it, it was just what if this, not right. like the basis they are did, so they low. They didn't have anything to substantiate. And they were just trolling, you know? And they were just like being shock jocks. Just shock jocking all over the place. That's By the way, Don. Thank you, Dan. That was beautiful. Beautifully articulated. Thank you so much. Um, Dawn, because uh, I had given a shout out to, uh, you know, it, it expound on when she complimented Ben and I and agreed with us. Uh, she said, oh, she was regarding being selfish can be a good thing. And it may have, have to be learned. She goes, I understand that taking care of families is important, but in some cases, I'm keeping at an arm's length. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Don, for for, uh, clarifying and and adding to the conversation and the dialogue in general. Um, I have a question for you guys. So also in that paragraph I read, she says... Man's highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness. I was wondering what you thought of that. I agree with that. Oh, yeah? I agree with that specifically because it, it, it goes back to if I am not taking care of myself, happiness can be a lot of things. I can tell you right now, coming off of COVID and currently dealing with allergies, if I don't take care of me, I'm rubbish here. If I don't take care of me, I'm of no use. You know, so if I'm not drinking enough water, if I'm not getting enough sleep, if I'm not eating, you know, healthy food, I'm crap to everyone else around me. I, I'll, I'll say that, that's, that's my take on it, if that makes sense. If you were starving, would you rather be? Would you rather have food, or would you rather be happy? Well, happiness is food at that point. Nope. You you have the the choice. Door one is happiness. Door two is food. You're starving to death. What are you gonna pick? In that scenario, I will take food. So but, happiness but is I, yeah. But I personally don't think you can separate that out. Because That's fair. At that point, this, you know, food is going to make me happy. Yeah. This this just sort of. Uh, yeah, thought I, experiment I, and the idea where like I don't think happiness is the I highest understand up there. where you were going you know like I was gonna say the same sleep, thing food air to breathe I think those are all very much they more all make than me happiness happy. and you can't achieve happiness without those things so there are other steps in between that's just how I see it kind of a Maslow's hierarchy I think uh, good times Maslow yeah I was gonna say I disagreed with that statement too 
in that I'm kind of skeptical of happiness as something that needs to be a like continual emphasis in your own life. I think it kind of leads. But I think to your point, uh, happiness, you'd have to define it better. So we're all kind of on the same page. I suspect, I suspect when you talk about happiness, you're not talking about like pure pleasure seeking, right? Like, you know, the, the dopamine hit. Absolutely, I am. No, I'm not. No, (laughs) No, I'm not. (laughs) I couldn't resist looking into the camera and saying that. But I also think, but I think like, I don't know, I think... Yeah, we'll see what you think about this. I think there's problems with this argument, but I mean, I, I don't want us to get completely hung up on the word happiness either. Well, I, I mean, think it's useful. I, I think because I think sometimes I think it can lead to selfishness or like I need to make myself happy, and that's what's the most important thing. And I don't think it always is the most important thing. I think sometimes this part of it is your obligations to others. Like I think that it is. In most, in a lot of cases, probably the correct choice to sacrifice your own happiness for your child's, um, you know, to some extent. I, you, we can think of instances in where that maybe that's a bad idea, but I think in a lot of times that's sort of an expectation, and you should do it. Um, I also think that even just accepting hardship uh, in our own lives. Um, doing doing hard things, doing difficult things, uh, you're not necessarily happy in the moment, um, but it's more fulfilling. Like I maybe I want to kind of draw this distinction between fulfillment and happiness, okay. or meaning and happiness. People probably put them together, but but I feel like sometimes using the word happiness is like I should feel joyful and, and cheerful every day. But I don't think that's necessary, and I think it kind of leads us to make weird uh, choices that are are leave us less fulfilled in the, in the long run or something. So. And that's a, a a fabulous distinction, and that's where I didn't want to get too hung up on the word happiness, because um, again, you know, going into you know the fact that I keep deep diving into law of attraction stuff and whatever, and just you know, utilizing things from it as guideposts and things like that. I recognize my emotions are, are letting me know kind of where I'm at, you know. So, for example, I just learned that I have a nasty tax bill. Okay. And does that make me happy? No. However, I could... I So... From the law of attraction standpoint, right, I could beat the drum of, you know, well, first and foremost, I don't agree with my tax prep person. You know, I, I, I think it was, you know, there's another way to look at my circumstances. And, um, and in fairness, you know, they gave me the opportunity. I can, you know, I can seek someone else that might see things the way I was, you know, doing them and and all of that said, so I could beat the drum of, oh, woe is me, I'm a victim, and, and throw a big old pity party, and I could just be miserable. I could have not slept a wink after hearing, you know, what my potential tax bill could be, and it still very much could be that, and, and you know, but there are things that I can do. There are programs and whatever, whatever. I could run down the rabbit hole and be absolutely miserable and panicked and anxious and everything else, or I could embrace it like I am. Well, I will make a call to this other preparer. I will have a conversation before I sign off and just, you know, take on said bill and deal with its payment. And on the way in, I was feeling kind of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You know, I'm, I'm going to get satisfaction out of this process and that's the kind of happiness I'm referring to you don't have to you know if I'm starving and and you know this door has food it may not be my favorite food I'm a whole food plant-based person would I eat the lamb chop yes I would if I am starving and I will be satisfied for that and happy that I got the lamb chop. So, if you were an objectivist <laughs> and you got that tax bill, 
would you accept it and be happy? As an objectivist, as an objectivist, I probably would have uh, followed other logic and rationale and made enough money, and it wouldn't be a it would be a moot point. I'd have so much money. Okay. That was a fun game. <laughs> Let's do that. Oh, something else from Don. <laughs> Um, happiness, oh, here we go, Don uh, chimes in, happiness comes from within, speak and live much like children, and n Don has an absolute perfect uh, teacher within her family, and yes, that's a shout out, Mr. Archie, her grandson, um, she, you know, we, I think we can learn, and me, who never, never signed up for being a parent, I know that we learn from children, and, and, and I, that, you know, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I always say, you know, if you're going to actually, you know, be a parent and raise your children and everything, mm -hmm. it's like, I, applause to you. I never signed up for that. No. I didn't sign up for it, but I appreciate it. She said, percentage of adults smiling daily or being happy is much less than a child. She said, maybe this is too generalized, but if you speak negative, I think you are living, an un living unhappy in life. Thank you, Don, for your feedback and, and, and input. So I'm curious um, what Don's take on uh, objectivism. <laughs> Translate that into objectivism, my friend. So I want to shift or really kind of go back to you had written down Ayn Rand's kind of like problems with communism. And, and we had started to talk about it this morning. Which so we don't you, know at this point. We are just speculating. Well, OK, so maybe well, maybe I, not, about it, I see it as <laughs> this is connected to our conversation earlier in the morning where we were kind of pre-discussing this topic and you had talked about some of her critiques of government. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Can you re-articulate those? Because I think there's, there's actually ways in which I think Ayn Rand is correct in her criticism uh, mm -hmm. that is worth talking about, but maybe you can kind of try to encapsulate what what her criticism is real quick. I do think that uh, you're reflecting back on um, again back to the that what kicked this all off well it didn't kick it all off but it certainly you know led it into something that we wanted to dive into the Mike Wallace interview absolutely I mean I would strongly recommend anyone watch it um, but he he presented her with you know her objectivism you know the the pure pure marketplace that does not exist um, and he and his his critique of of that was well in your situation what you're saying is that if you focus on pure market pure capitalism mm -hmm. pure marketplace and that everything will sort itself out and be ducky for everyone he was saying we you know, when we began as a country, that's kind of, you know, where, where we were going, kind of what we were doing, and that, that it was unchecked, and that we ended up with all these robber barons, and that, you know, the way to deal with the robber barons was to bring in some of the things that Ayn was extremely critical of, to, to you know, the anti trust laws and everything where she's very vocal about the hindrance of the independent uh, you know businessman in her pure pure marketplace capital ph philosophical land and what um, I remembered she had answered him she had addressed that she said in this country, America, in this country, because they weren't actually following her philosophical pure marketplace, that the robber barons were created by our government subsidizing and things like that, 
and that's where that went. Maybe that's where Atlas shrugged. <laughs> oh, by the way, before we, before you you uh, uh, chime in on that, Beth S. Hey, Beth, welcome back. She goes, I think relying on outside things to make a person happy will always leave us wanting. Well, no truer words have been uh, written or spoken there. She goes, um, happiness is more a life philosophy. You can count your blessings or you can count your detriments. The choice is always up to the individual. Beth, that was gorgeous. Thank you so much. Now, so is that what you were thinking about uh, yeah. when you were kind of setting up for me to uh, recount yeah. our, our pre-show conversation? And I think, I don't know, I think, I think she makes an important point uh, in that respect. Um, kind of one thing I think of is regulation, sort of a, a side effect of regulation, it's especially things that constrain businesses, is that it favors uh, large incumbents a lot of times. And kind of one example would be, you know, I think there was, let me see if I can think of a concrete example instead of sure. a hypothetical one. Like there's, so for instance, you know, content moderation on social networks like Facebook or something. There's often been uh, talks about, hey, uh, these large companies should have, these companies should have to moderate or at least pay attention to the content that's being generated on their on their websites uh, and they need to be like held liable for some you know potentially for some of the the things people post mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that's a, a reasonable kind of response to some of the terrible things that show up on social networking sites sometimes the downside though is that um, the only companies that can truly afford to do the content moderation at the level of, um, you know, precision... The regulatory requirement? ...of the regulatory... ...are the large, well-established firms. And so, like, what happens is... And sometimes you'll see it in, in that even these social media companies are like, yes, we would like some more regulation, please. And I think part of it is that they can afford to deal with the re regulation, but that creates a moat around their company that uh, makes them less susceptible to upstarts that could, you know, serve the customer better potentially. The, the upstarts uh, that would actually be competition, and that was right. something that she was a champion of. And so, because that's a free market society. I think she's with a, getting with a balance of healthy competition. I think she's getting at something important there in the in the way that regulation often enshrines kind of these and protects some of these large uh, companies uh, and prevents kind of the free competition. Which um, does also bring me back to, I had mentioned, and Dan didn't hear this part, I don't think, I think he was very busy setting everything up, mm -hmm. but um, I had mentioned, you know, one of, one, my, one of my favorite robber barons, Rockefeller, Standard Oil. Now, Interestingly, and I don't know, I don't have the facts on this, but I was curious because when she had, when when Ayn had responded to Wallace and commented that, it, you know, our government has subsidized the robber barons. I, even though I'm chagrined to say that while I'm mostly through the book Titan, about Rockefeller. He did get subsidies. He did. And, 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 Baron, Robert, Baron. And, and then ultimately, antitrust laws came into being, which was kind of what she was talking about. It seems that in my reading of the book, because he did not come from money. He his was, dad was, he a, was true. Uh, he, his dad a was vagrant, a snake oil yeah, salesman. Yeah. Dad was a snake oil salesman with a second family, I believe. Uh, yeah, he was just a charlatan completely. And, and young, young John 
Rockefeller, you know, taking care of mom and things like that, and and being raised very, you know, I, I'd even say, you know, pious life certainly He's early very on. Very strong Baptist, very, or, very or something. strong, and and in fact, did in fact do a lot of good uh, with charities and things like that, and abolitionist, and you know, a lot of really cool things there. But with regard to like, this is like something too why we can't overlook where Anne I sorry, Ayn, where Ayn came from and the communist environment that she was born into and grew up in because for the same reason why she went way over this way, Rockefeller went way over this way with money became, to me, like the most important thing. Right, okay. Now, with that money, with his wealth, with his riches, he very much took care of his family and was charitable and took care of community and so on and so forth. He did a lot of good. He also destroyed people in the process and he didn't have government subsidies to do that, but he was ruthless, a ruthless businessman. And what he ended up doing was squashing the competition. Now he did that without government subsidy if I'm remembering the earlier sections of the book Titan. If anyone's reading that currently and and goes, nah, that's not exactly true. But um, however, there are, I think there are many, many a robber baron that did benefit. And certainly when he got to that certain point, you know, when Standard Oil, you know, came into existence. And again, that was him oft times using extremely ruthless horrid tactics to get the competition to sell to him right and then just build that empire and create standard oil and so on i mean he was a brilliant businessman he saw that kerosene was going the way of the dodo okay and i mean again incredibly interesting book by the way but when it got to the point where in fact now you do have government subsidies and you do have this Monopoly. Yeah. I think she might she might have been talking a bit about that. She did say. Uh, by the way, Don chimed in and said it's easy. Oh, it's easy to be charitable when you have money and get large tax deductions. Yes, it is, my friend. Yes, it is. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting topic. I think. Um, big topic role of tax deductions and charities and philanthropy in I'm the all world. for it um, but I think that I'm all for it. another thing that you had kind of mentioned maybe at the beginning when we first started talking this afternoon was you said something about communism sort of devolving into a couple well compensated sort of oligarchs yes. or something. Can you say that and part? In fact, to this day, there are ol- well, right, yeah. oligarchs. So, what was her yes. argument there, yes, if that you the, remember? That the, and again, this is not my area of expertise in any way, shape, or form, but my understanding, and, and I've heard it from sources outside of Ayn Rand, talking about, you know, Soviet Union, you know, again, a uh, on paper, on paper, it looks great. Everyone, everyone has a roof over their head and clothes on their back and food on their table and 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 it's a collective and it it on paper it's beautiful. In reality, it ended up with oh look, we have Putin. Putin's life as opposed to Joe Average in, in his own country. Well, there's a continental divide of their quality of life, their comfort level, their access to things. So on paper, it works. So far, it hasn't really worked. My, again, we were talking my understanding not an area of expertise, yeah. but I think that's partly part of Ayn's 
I think one, observations yeah. and and why she's so. I think one interesting way of describing this that I've heard, essentially, the argument is that sure the government uh, is supposed to be able to do all these things for us to like redistribute and make people equitable but then it devolves into like oligarchy um, where a couple people profit at the expense of, of others. And like one, one way I've seen this put before that I liked is that it's really not a choice between free markets and government. It's a choice between free markets and political markets. Mm-hmm. And the point the person was making, this was uh, David Friedman, he was like a He's an economist, um, but the idea is that without free markets, you get political markets where politicians behind closed doors are making trades and doing favors and figuring out ways to benefit. Or maybe the Supreme Court. Benefit one maybe another. Some Supreme Court justices. And got got them on your yacht the, uh, in your back pocket. And Sorry. Um, and so. We, I think, like ideally, in, in you know a utopia or like an abstract sense, we imagine that okay, there's this this problem with free markets. The government needs to step in and kind of make it run better. But in reality, the government is not like a an altruistic philosopher king that always does things perfectly. It's made up of a bunch of people that are also self interested. Um, but now it just happens in a non-transparent way that people um, don't have good visibility into. And so I think there's something important about... Did they have transparency before and it's become um, obscured? Or I would say that transparency has always been kind of a problem. Right, but the idea of the, of the free market, you know... Are we talking stock- Ein's objective... I'm talking about kind of, free market, her I'm, pure, her pure market. No, I'm just talking about markets in general oh, okay. where, you, <laughs> you know, you can see the price of all the stocks. No one's going to stop you from buying or selling whichever ones you want. Uh, you can make a trade if you think it's profitable. There's almost no barriers to entry. Um, if you think you can do something in there, if you want to make trades, you can. In the political market, it's about who you know and what types of access you have. Most people don't have access to it. Um, therefore, it is in a, in a way less transparent, right, uh-huh. than, than, um, than something that is, you know, a, a free or a public market, I guess, or an open market. I don't, I don't know what the right term is, but, um, and, and those are the true alternatives. It's not that you get a free market with its own problems, definitely, that has kind of, um, ways in which it fails and sort of a a perfect you know uh, state that'll fix it all and redistribute it uh, perfectly and make everything run efficiently it's you've got another group of people who are doing favors for one and one another I think that I don't know that that to me was a useful way of thinking about the what the true alternatives are um, between those two things so that's a lot, Ben. <clears throat> and um, I think it just it goes to I, I, compa- compare what you just said yeah. to what we have, what we what we do today, real time. Sure, like because you threw in you know in the you know altruistic or the the fantasy scenario, the philosophical scape, but where where do you think? we land in both and give me like both a positive negative where where we're currently at ayn is rolling in her grave but let's think about it i'm trying i mean right think of our current government is it populated by philosopher kings that only only do the make the right decisions and are completely what do you think dan interested Um, (laughs) we're getting a big and we get we have the government we have, and I think all governments are imperfect, right? There, it yeah. some are better, uh, certainly, and Agreed. more efficiently run, and, and different things. But when you think of like, hey, we need we need this to be regulated. Think of the people that are doing the regulating, right? And 
how irritating and sort of skeptical we're off we often are of them and kind of carry it forward like okay do we want to give this responsibility to this guy or is it worth you know doing it in this other way um and so you know talk about the 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 housing authority of the county of milwaukee there was the article right today Mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah they've been unregulated well i'm sure that there are i'm sure there are regulations Uh, but but the idea is there there's insufficient housing (laughs) for people and people can't afford uh their housing so they have this dispensation of subsidies to Mm -hmm. to help to help poor people out and it's a good and like that's it's good to help poor people out when you can. Um, but on the other hand, the government is not like a well-oiled machine that perfectly dispenses money and makes sure everything runs well. They're, they're inserting their own if inefficiencies and problems into the process. They don't have inspectors to make sure that the units are any good. Um, they don't have... Uh, financially literate people managing all the money uh, to make sure it goes where it's supposed to or that somebody's not embezzling it. Um, and these are, that's the government. Um, it's not always bad. Some some government organizations are really well, well run, but, but others are can, not. They can certainly fail in the same sort of terrible ways. Oh, when that, they fail. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think it's ugly. I think that's kind of what she was getting at. Um, you know, when she talks about oligarchy and people getting rich in government. I think and you've like actually that. very possibly, probably hit on kind of where her philosophy was born from and and why she was so passionate about yeah. it. And, and again, just like, you know, Dan and I, you know, we were talking too, it's a great philosophy, but it's Never gonna see the practical light of day. So it's all we can do to contend with what we have. I don't think I have anything more to say about Ein. I think we did a unless you I think, had. I think we've done a fine job of at least introducing for anyone who had no clue who Ein Rand was, or or uh, I think, never I think we heard the phrase objectivism before. Pat ourselves on the back. I thought this was actually a, a somewhat well-structured uh, discussion. It was. I think centering it around like one or two parts from this interview mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. helped a lot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, everyone contributed. But you know me, I like to stick with a theme if there is one. Yeah. And so, bravo, <laughs> Dan and Deb. Oh, yeah. And Ben. Love Dan's input. Thank you. Um, we could take a minute break and come back. A mini break and come back and give the lowdown for about the rest of the week kind of thing. What's tomorrow and yeah. Totally works for me. Well, you heard the man, Dan. Take us out for a mini break. Everyone out there, please stay tuned. Come back and join us. <laughs>